And welcome back everyone. So now that we've got that real quick intro out of the way, it's time to start putting this little utility application together. But we're gonna to need to be branching away from Antlerworks, right Nelson? Yeah, um, pretty much the first step that we need to take in order to figure out how this program is gonna work and well, to build the program in the first place is to see how we go from getting this, having this .g file, having this grammar file and actually having C Sharp classes that we can put in our project. And we do that with a, well, with Antler, um, but Antler in a different form. In this case, it's going to be an executable that we can run our grammar file against and get results. Okay. So I'm going to load up my browser, and I'm going to type in Antler, and we're going to go to antler.org because that's a difficult URL to remember that I should have remembered. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and go to the download link over here. And let's find, not Antler Works, but Antler version 3. And we're going to want to grab the C Sharp 3 runtime distribution. So download that. Um, and then go down here. And now you have a nice friendly list of random characters to choose from <laughs> as far as which distribution you want. Awesome. Um, so there's a, there's a little graph right here, though, fortunately. Um, we're going to want the runtime. We're going to want the um, – and the tool is basically all we need is the runtime and the tool. So I'm basically just going to grab um, this one, I believe. So that's antler.net tool 3.4. Okay, so now that I have this uh, there, let me go ahead and extract it somewhere so that we can use it. Um, I think I dumped my grammar file on my desktop, so let me go ahead and uh, extract. Desktop? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, this isn't my normal development you know, thing, and I don't use my desktop for anything anyway. Let's see, there's our JSON. Or yep. There's our basic JSON. No, which one? Looks like this one's newer. <laughs> so we'll use this one. All right. So the goal is is to run this program, Antler 3.executable, against this uh, basic JSON grammar file. Um, what I'm going to first going to do is I'm going to create a new folder and close Antlerworks, create a new folder just to get some organization in here. Um, I'm going to call this uh, just workspace and I'll toss it when I'm done. And then I'm going to put the basic uh, JSON.g file as well as the Antler.net tool. Now, inside of our antler.net tool, we have an antler3 executable, and this is what we're going to be using to generate our code files. So I'm going to shift, right-click, and hit open command window here. So again, that's shift, right-click, open command window here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do antler, blah, 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 antler3.executable, and I'm going to do basic json.g. And of course, I spelled... Jason O. Based on. Wow. <laughs> you can do it, Nelson. Not dot H. There we go. Yay. <laughs> we have typed in antler 3exe space base, basic json.g. So we passed in that as an input file. And check out what we got. Sweet. We, we got three awesome files. Now, the first file is one that's not actually going to be compiled with our program. Although... This is a very important file. And what this file uh, basically does is it establishes a common token vocabulary between all of the things that Antler might generate. So for example, if we were to create a tree parser or a different type of Antler um, parser, or in fact create another, uh, you know, just another parser just in general, we want to use reuse the same token vocabulary so that there's uh, the ability to communicate between these different uh, parsers. Uh, we use this tokens file to sort of create that commonality. This is a file that Antler itself will understand as it parses our stuff. The next thing we'll get is a basic JSON lexer.cs, which here is a recursive descent lexer written for us already there. So yeah, cool. that's neat. Um, we also have parser. So here's our parser. Awesome. So yeah, um, quite, a, quite a bit of code generated from those very uh, 
very simple rules that we put together. Oh, they'll get bigger. Oh, I know. I'm just saying. <laughs> I wish I could remember what achievements I got for uh, including one of these files in my um, Visual Studio instance once. It was like, I think, I think they used go-tos at some point or something, and I got berated for that. I also got berated for the amount of local, ver uh, local fields and stuff. <laughs> it was kind of embarrassing. But, of course, it's generated code. It doesn't need to be maintained. Right. So now we have these two files. So there's a few things we can do here. Um, probably what I'm going to go ahead and do now is just uh, drop these into a project and see how we can instantiate them. Um, and use them just to provide some context. And the next video, I'll actually build the program that'll do this for us okay. automatically. Sounds good. So I'm going to start up a Visual Studio instance that, of course, came up on a different monitor. So just give it a sec or a year. Eventually. Or a couple of years. Oh, it's slow tonight. It's still going. All right. Um. This is taking longer than usual. Um, so, we got a window. Hey. Uh, uh, Maybe? No, it's uh, frozen. You want me to hit pause? I can hit pause. Uh, it's almost there. It just has a little spinny wheel. Yep. Oh. So close. I saw it for a second. Here we go. Yay. And this is Visual Studio. So now that we've successfully launched Visual Studio, um, I'm going to go ahead and create a new console application in my garbage folder. And then I'm going to dump the Lexer and the Parser um, into my project. So I'm just going to select these in Windows Explorer, drag and drop into my solution. So now we have a basic JSON Lexer and a basic JSON Parser. Now there will be one thing that you need to do. And this is very important. Antler has a runtime, and you need to include it as a reference to the runtime DLL. To do that, not surprisingly, we add a reference to the Antler runtime DLL, which, because I put it over here and then here. OK, we're going to go ahead and want to grab antler 3runtime We don't need any of these other items. We don't need string template. We don't want the debug runtime. We're just good with uh, the runtime.dll. Mm -hmm. Now that this DLL has been referenced, all those errors go away, and we have two compiling classes. Well, uh, maybe. Or do we? <laughs> oh, you might want to go and explain that to them. I, I, you may have once before, but... <laughs> okay. Well, there is a difference between the uh, Java runtime and the C-sharp uh, runtime. And the difference is, in the Java runtime, the hidden constant is all caps. In the C-sharp uh, runtime, it is that case. So just to, I'm not going to edit this file. Editing these files is a bad, bad idea. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete these two out from my solution. I'm going to jump back over to my console window. And I'm going to jump back into my workspace. I'll open up basic JSON.g, edit with Notepad++, and I want to go ahead and scroll all the way down to where we have hidden this uh, white space token and replace it with that. Now I'm going to hit Control S, hit the up arrow and enter. We'll get two nice classes generated for us right here, and I'm going to drag and drop them in, into my solution. At this point, we should have a compiling application, and we do. Nice. So how do we use these uh, two classes? Well, first of all, we start with the Lexer. So let's instantiate the Lexer. I'm going to say var Lexer equals new basic JSON Lexer. Now you'll see that it requires, or doesn't require, but um, at some point at during construction or later, you will have to pass in an iChar stream input. Mm -hmm. There's a few different classes that implement an IHR stream input. You have a file stream, an input stream, a reader stream, and a string stream. The um, reader stream, um, I'll just go over the different, uh, different signatures. The reader stream is going to take in a text reader, not surprisingly. The file stream is going to take in a file name. The input stream is going to take in a stream. And the string stream is going to take in a character array or a string input. We're going to use a string stream. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to define my input up here. I'm going to say input equals one, two, three, four. And I'm going to pass an input to my constructor and I'm going to terminate this line. So at this point, we've instantiated our lexer that was generated for us by Antler. Mm -hmm. And we've also passed in a Antler string stream that's going to go ahead and um, read in our input as a string. Mm -hmm. Now, the next step is we have to instantiate our parser. And our parser takes in a token stream. And a token stream, you can see this came from Java, right? Right. Um, it takes a buffer token stream, a common token stream, a legacy common token stream, a token <laughs> rewrite stream, and an unbuffered token stream. We don't care about the legacy. We don't care about the rewrite. We don't care about the buffered or the unbuffered. We just want a common token stream. We don't need any special features. We're not doing any backtracking. So we're just going to go with a common token stream. Now, the common token stream takes in an iToken source. Um, fortunately for us, the Lexer implements this interface. So we can literally pass in the lexer. So now what can we do? Well, here's the thing. Can't really do anything. I'm not even kidding. Um, I just wanted to point out uh, just this uh, straightforward way that you instantiate these two classes. Mm -hmm. But I also wanted to drive home the point that this parser actually doesn't do anything. The way that we do something with this parser is we're going to go ahead and have to add a partial uh, class definition that matches our parser class. And we're going to have to go ahead and access some uh, private methods on this class. Specifically, we're going to have to access the, um, do you remember in our, uh, our grammar we have this, uh, da, 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 yeah, sure, why not, why not? Uh, remember how we have this file rule up here? Mm -hmm. Check this out. Here's a file method. Mm -hmm. This corresponds directly with the file rule. Now you see it's private void file. Now what's cool about this method is when I invoke it, it's going to go ahead and run the parser against the input that I passed into the constructor. But it's not going to return anything. That's another important thing. This is something where people can get very confused on when messing with Antler for the first time. This will not return anything by default unless we tell it to. If we tell it to return something, the only thing we can tell it to return is either the result of a string template, which we're not covering, um, or the result of an AST. Um, so we would get a common uh, tree back. However, we still can't access this private, private void file method because, well, it's private. So to or in order to actually write code against uh, our basic JSON parser that can access this method, let's go ahead and create a partial class definition um, and go from there. So you'll see that this class is not placed inside of a namespace. So in our global namespace, we can go ahead and say partial class basic JSON parser. And we can go ahead and say public void run. And what's run going to do? It's going to call file. Still, though, it doesn't do anything. <laughs> Still doesn't do anything. Um, we can do parser.run. And technically, what just happened as I ran this application is that Lexer parsed this just fine. Okay. But what what the problem is is that obviously we can't actually, you know, in any way access or get any data back from this method. Um, and that leads into a discussion a little bit later about actions. But just to give you a hint, what we can do is we can actually inject C-sharp code into Antler rules themselves and have that C-sharp code be literally outputted into the methods that Antler generates for us. For example, I could say something like console. I just want to show a, a, a nice little example really quickly. So let's say inside of a, of a every time we hit a number, I want to do, in, these are curly brackets, mm -hmm. I want to do system.console.writeline money number.text. So that's all I added. I added an action to the system. And we're going to be going over actions, but I just wanted to point this out. So now if I recompile my other stuff, check this out. I'm going to redump these in and I'm going to replace them. So now we've effectively replaced everything. Now if I do a so search for console.writeline, check that out. Very nice. We actually, 
dumped code into our generated file. So now if I were to run this, uh, well, well, I saw it, but yeah. <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. We now have one, two, three, four. Very cool. So that's an example, sort of an end to end. I realize that we haven't actually gone over the things that make uh, or that we're going to go over, but I just wanted to show an example of these classes being used to do an actual thing um, so that there's a little bit more context as we move forward with the application that's going to be compiling all of these classes behind the scenes for us. Sure, but they, the nice thing that they were able to take away from this video is they saw you several times having to go back over, recompile, and then bring the, uh, the new CS files back over into our project here and just the back and forth. Yep. And you're going to be getting rid of that. Yep. All right, so is that going to pretty much wrap this video up here? Uh, yeah. Awesome. All right, well, we'll catch you guys in the next video. Thanks a lot.